Good morning and thank you to organizers and to my co-panelists and to everyone for getting up on a Friday morning and joining us. This is Anna Jeans, my, my subject. Uh, I just want to share a little historical context. Historians have theorized philanthropy, whether the giving of money or time to better society, as a form of parallel power structures or as an avenue for women's public influence well before the franchise. And we find this phenomenon not always labeled as philanthropy per se, but in the stories of women across racial, class, and ethnic communities. My focus this morning is on financial giving. In the histories of education, much attention has focused on issues of access and opportunity through women's strategic, coercive, or strings-attached philanthropy. Women were able to, through philanthropy, to reach into male-dominated or exclusive spaces, to open up opportunity, especially for girls and women, and to influence institutional decision-making and policy. And many of you in the audience, I'm sure, will be familiar with Mary Garrett's large gift uh, to secure women's admission to Johns Hopkins Medical School, Grace Dodge's uh, giving to bring women into what becomes the School of Education of Columbia University, and Madam C.J. Walker's $1,000 gift to the YMCA of Indianapolis, uh, which supported young boys and young men, but she really did it to serve the women of Indianapolis. This historical context of women's giving is important for thinking about Anna Jeans and about her gifts and donations in education with an eye towards change. Uh, Jeans was born on April 7th, 1822 in Germantown, Pennsylvania. She was the last of 10 children born to a well-established Hicksite Quaker family. When she was four, she lost her mother, but she grew up in a household of siblings, a well-to-do household preoccupied with the world's work, trade, medicine, abolition, and philanthropy. Although she left no document outlining her thoughts about philanthropy the way her male contemporaries Andrew Carnegie or John Rockefeller or Julius Rosenwald did, Anna Jean's giving was not merely ad hoc big check writing that was scattered. Much of it was directed to local institutions, often to honor relatives. Her philanthropic vision and commitments were shaped and enabled by the privileges of race and class, by examples of philanthropic women such as her sister Mary, and were anchored in faith and family. And she becomes the sole heir to the family fortune. In 1907, she hand drafts her own will. She does that in April. She passes away in the fall. Education figures prominently in her bequests. Perhaps the best known of her gifts is one that looked beyond Philadelphia to the South. The Jeans Fund was an example of a new charitable form, a secular endowed philanthropic foundation. It aimed not to apply a Band-Aid, as in old-fashioned charity, but to address root causes of a pressing concern. Jane set up a million-dollar endowment to support Black education in the South with Booker T. Washington of Tuskegee and Hollis Frisell of Hampton just a few months before she passed away. The Jeans Fund has both conservative and forward-looking aspects. It was set up not to focus on college studies, but on developing rural black schooling. It had a predominantly white board, but it was one of the very few, perhaps even the only foundation of its time to have black educators as trustees. It supported the leadership of black female teachers and supervisors, but it promoted industrial education rather than liberal arts. Now, far less well known but very relevant to discussions of educational philanthropy today was Jean's bequest to Swarthmore College. Like the fund, the bequest to Swarthmore was also an expression of Anna Jean's vision of the good. This bequest, which was ultimately rejected, would transfer mining rights thought to be worth about a million dollars to Swarthmore on the condition that the Quaker institution discontinue intercollegiate sports. But you really have to read that as football. Um, so there were clear strings attached. This was a gift to influence academic decision-making and policy. To Jean's, football was morally reprehensible. It was problematic. It was antithetical to her religious values. Quote, they must be ungodly men who mimic war when there is peace, she bemoaned. She was not alone. Even Charles Eliot, president of Harvard, um, critiqued football for its brutality. Football was popular, but dangerous and brutal. Players might suffer severe lasting injury, and in some cases, death. In 1905, Nicholas Murray Butler, 
discontinued football at Columbia University. And in that same year, uh, the news reports in the US recorded 19 player deaths and 137 se severe injuries. And it was actually really a photo of um, a Swarthmore player, Tiny Maxwell, uh, who came off the football field all bloody and staggering that sort of set off this litany of um, media reports and controversy surrounding football. So much so that President Teddy Roosevelt convenes a meeting of athletic directors and establishes the Intercollegiate Athletic Association of the United States. Jean's bequest did have an impact on Swarthmore and on higher ed, but not in the way she as a donor actually intended. In considering whether to accept the bequest, Swarthmore tried to discern the true monetary value of the rights, and it solicited input from administrators across the country. And that discussion is actually preserved in the Swarthmore Bulletin, which is a very unique uh, uh, archival uh, recording of, of uh, this discussion. Now, supporters said, oh, it's money. Take the money. It's money. Uh, compromisers said, well, you know, maybe we could experiment, take the money and give it back if it doesn't work. Or, and here was a novel thought, maybe we'd become a women's college because, you know, women don't play sports. Uh, though that was not true, but that was, that was an assertion. Uh, the folks who argued against accepting the bequest dominated. And these educators underscored the mission and distinctive nature of higher ed institutions and their core value of autonomy. Can trustees today bind future generations? Does this type of conditional endowment exert what was called, quote, a dead hand on future decision making? Might ending collegiate sports actually be uh, bad for education, antithetical to a holistic view of education? And as I mentioned, in the end, uh, the bequest was, was turned down. Um, but Considering it anew is, is a very worthy thing to do. We have a long tradition of women's giving in the US of which Anna Jeans is an important, but I would argue understudied figure. Her giving reflected her life and engaged the issues of her time, no less than high profile women donors like McKinsey Scott does today. The Jeans Fund and the Swarthmore Gifts are examples not, over, not only of recovery history, which is, you know, women gave too, um, but they provide insight into the dynamics of philanthropy. And we see Jean's philanthropic imagination at work. We see her values embedded in her gifts. And you see her trying to use a gift to exert or express those values. Uh, in the case of Swarthmore, the strings attached did not work. They failed. Uh, as we elaborate, there's a lot of, there's an efflorescence of interest in women's philanthropy at the current time. And as we elaborate the history of philanthropy and education, including women's benefaction, we need to capture the complex value-laden nature of women's giving and the meaning of the philanthropic gift, not only for the donor, but also for the recipient. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Cece Borzaleri. Hello, everyone, and thank you for logging in to be with us today. Um, I want to also extend a big thank you to the organizers, sponsors, fellow panelists for putting together this great program over these past few days. I had a great time uh, logging in and, and listening to everyone. Um, the title of my talk is Professional Motherhood. It's a concept that I developed as an undergraduate at Georgetown to describe the phenomenon that I saw taking place among graduates of the Litchfield Female Academy. Uh, the academy operated from 1792 to 1833, which is almost identical to the years of the Young Ladies Academy of Philadelphia. Um, so the stories of Litchfield girls are quite similar to those uh, of the girls who attended that academy in Philadelphia. Um, the graduates of the two schools found themselves in the same uh, somewhat unique position in society. Um, and many of them graduated to, to take up uh, what I would call careers in charitable and benevolent societies with their positions resembling those of modern CEOs, CFOs, and other sorts of leadership positions. 
Uh, some historians who I'm incredibly indebted to uh, include Nancy Cott, Lori Ginsburg, and Rosemary Zagari, who have studied this sort of topic um, in a large, a large way in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and I'm looking at it only through, at this point, the small lens of Litchfield, Connecticut. Uh, the women who graduated from the Litchfield Female Academy and the Young Ladies Academy of Philadelphia were overeducated for their prospects. They were often moneyed, though not always. They were often quite religious, though again, not always. Um, they were almost always exceptionally feminine through both their training and their uh, family backgrounds. Uh, and they were, uh, certainly they were white. Um, they learned their prescribed roles through their training in needlework, dancing, and music lessons at school and especially at Litchfield through their experiences boarding with local families. Uh, in these homes, girls were expected to continue their educations at all hours of the day, learning from the women of, of the home how to run a successful and respectable home for polite society. Upon leaving school, many became wives and mothers and otherwise fulfilled the roles expected of them, but a large portion also engaged in more formal careers, including in activism pushing for social change. After their years in school, learning skills like letter writing, mathematics, geography, and history, making friends with other young ladies from across New England, and experiencing the religious fervor of Lyman Beecher's orations at the Congregational Church of Litchfield, graduates of the Litchfield Female Academy often had a thirst for life that encouraged a more active presence in their adulthood. Um, the activities undertaken by this segment of the population fall into a category of professional motherhood. Um, their activities can be deemed professional because of the public, tangible, and organized community impact. And I call it motherhood because the skills that they employed were distinctly maternal, joining and forming benevolent associations aimed at feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, healing the sick, spreading the good news of religion, and promoting education among boys and girls. They had the highest possible level of training and attained the highest levels of leadership within their fields. And they considered themselves to have lots of work to do. And while they did not often draw salaries from their positions in benevolent organizations, they did certainly work full-time schedules. So without upending the social system, these professional mothers provided extra familial maternal support to those in their communities whom they felt that they could save and help. Professional mothers operated in an area of contradiction, one in which women worked professionally in executive roles with public impact and often high visibility, while often continuing to insist that the social structures in place did not require significant alteration. The contemporaries of these professional mothers similarly attempted to understand the women's goals within the context of existing social norms as best they could articulate it. The two examples I'll be sharing today are especially indicative of the contradictory positions that women often occupied as professional mothers. First woman I'm highlighting is uh, Mary Pierce Twining. She attended the Litchfield Female Academy from 1821 to 1822. And afterwards, she dedicated her time and energies to the cause of the New Haven Orphans Asylum, where she spent over 35 years working in their leadership. The organization carried out a maternal role for orphaned and non-orphaned destitute children in New Haven, Connecticut. Residence in the New Haven Orphan Asylum meant uh, that children could other, who were otherwise helpless were cared for, kept healthy, provided with religious and academic educations, and socialized as children rather than being put to work as might have been the case had they fallen into the care of other organizations that took in young people of a similar situation. Women were nearly the exclusive caregivers for children in this residence comprising a staff of academic and religious teachers, domestic aides, and managers of the organization's operations were nearly entirely female. This included Twining, who served as, among other positions, the group's treasurer um, within her 35-year tenure in leadership. While the day-to-day -day operation of the orphan asylum appeared to be fully run by women, the organization's internal record keeping and centennial celebrations taking place in the 1930s credit the formation of the organization to a pair of male doctors. They found themselves the caregivers of four children whose parents, their patients, had died. Rather than bound themselves to a life of domesticity and child care, the doctors instead organized a group of women to come together and sustain a home for local children who found themselves without other options. The work in tandem between men and women and the passivity of the role 
um, or the passivity of the women in the initial stages of this organization coming together um, are a notable feature. Men saw room for women to serve a professionalized purpose and they uh, extended an invitation for them to do so. Mary Twining's story is especially illustrative of the unique role of professional mothers as compared to more outright activists. Commonly, professional motherhood relied upon the status quo and the support of men in their communities to be successful. These women weren't burning their bras, but rather they were going around asserting that they could contribute a bit more than they were already to help the world go around just a bit more smoothly. Women involved in benevolent associations more generally, founded by men or by women, could fall into the category of professional motherhood. It was not a requirement for men to extend the invitation, nor was it required for the whole society to accept a group's mission. Many organizations faced uh, backlash and controversy, especially when they treaded into waters such as religion or later in medicine. Uh, my second example today is Mary Hopkins Goodrich. She existed as sort of a lady of legend in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where uh, her role as the founder and leader of the Laurel Hill Association was the first village improvement society in the United States. Goodrich's first story is one of complications due to two competing desires. One, to applaud women publicly for their increasingly prominent service to society, and another for uh, the maintenance of the structures that already govern society. A great example of the legendary nature of Mary Goodrich is a story told by historian Margaret Cresson, who wrote in 1953 to describe the moment that Mary decided to beautify her village. She wrote, a woman dressed in a long black riding habit mounted on a white horse was picking her way through the Stockbridge burial ground. Mary Hopkins in her late thirties was very handsome in a healthy, high spirited, dynamic way. She rode her horse with ease and confidence, but there were no paths in the cemetery. The place was full of weeds and burdocks and tangled vines, so the going was difficult. It seemed incredible to her that people could accept with apathy and indifference such conditions as she saw around her. It was a disgrace to the living and an affront to the dead. And so ultimately, uh, Cresson said that Goodrich said to herself in the cemetery, somebody should do something about this that somebody has got to do something about this, and it looks like that somebody is going to be me. So this account seems to portray uh, Goodrich as the protagonist of a children's story, one who can accomplish anything simply with the power of belief in her own potential. But the minutes of the meetings and the records of the public presentations reveal that Goodrich did not feel that it was her place to have a public voice on behalf of the association and she chose instead to defer to her male counterparts when it came to public engagements. At the first town meeting of the Laurel Hill Association, Mary intended to speak only if required, and ultimately she only gave a few short words from the audience rather than the stage. In fact, she didn't speak from the stage at a meeting of the Laurel Hill Association, which she founded until 1893 on the occasion of the association's 40th anniversary. The discrepancy between the legendary presentation of Mary the Beloved Savior and the simultaneous story of Mary the Timid Little Lady underscores the contradictions of professional motherhood. There was a flurry of benevolent activity and extensive work behind the scenes, but the community was not quite ready to accept her as simply a professional. A history of the Berkshire Mountains from 1902 celebrated the Laurel Hill Association as an ideal manner in which women could involve themselves in the public. The author wrote, quote, before woman clamors for rights she has not, let her use the rights she has. Village improvement is within her sphere and influence. Many believe that it is her work, a work she can do best. So putting aside the explicit misogyny and condescension of that writing, um, the meaning really does exemplify the position that Mary Hopkins Goodrich and her peers held as professional mothers. She mobilized her domestic skills as, at a much greater scale than was typically done, and the results revolutionized her community. She acted as the maternal figure that the town was clearly in desperate need for. Overall, the work of professional mothers represented a small incremental step towards more acceptance of women doing substantial professional work. Um, and this is something that I think is worthy of study on its own. Additionally, it's important because of how social response indicates the plasticity of social structures, how boundaries reacted when they were nudged rather than overthrown. 
So this is how I made sense of a phenomenon that I saw taking place when writing as an undergrad. And now that I'm in graduate school, I'm glad to be um, beyond grateful for the opportunity to speak to this audience. And so I am welcoming uh, thoughts, critiques, and questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cece. And um, our next speaker is Carolyn. Hi, everyone. I'm going to quickly share a PowerPoint with you all. Get started here. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some cases from the Rosine Association. I'm sorry if you hear my dog crying in the background. He is still not used to Zoom after a year. <laughs> In January of 1847, a group of women met in a private parlor to petition the legislature of Pennsylvania to abolish capital punishment. They also arranged a public meeting of women to circulate their petition. Approximately 500 women attended the meeting, an address was read, and within several weeks, 1,000 copies of the address had been circulated and over 11,000 names had been added to the petition. From this meeting of women came the call for society to open a house for the purposes of reforming, employing, and instructing women who had fallen into immoral habits and livelihoods. Thus, a new benevolent society of women was formed in Philadelphia. The records of the Rosine Association provide a lens for analyzing some of the women of Philadelphia. And the casebooks of the Rosine Association are a unique source because they detail the stories of the women who were sought out and who did seek out this society. They reveal the successes of the Rosine Association, but also the painful failures and losses of this society. These sources help to shed a light on the lives of women who would otherwise be difficult to find or entirely invisible in the historical record. The Rosine Association emerged during a period of change in women's moral reform in the United States. Due in part to the Second Great Awakening of the early antebellum period, there had been a surge of movements promoting social change and moral reformation in America. Women played a key role in the ideology and activism of these movements. However, by the late 1840s, just as the Rosine Association would be emerging, moral reform was changing in the US. Moral suasion had failed to transform society and reformers were increasingly prioritizing new means of implementing change. New emphasis on electoral power had rendered older means of women's activism less effective and less popular. However, women were adapting to these changes and new reform societies were still emerging with the intention of addressing moral reform. The Rosine Association was one of these new institutions in Philadelphia. The original organizers behind the 1847 petition, which included women like Mira Townsend, who I will talk about several times throughout this talk, um, were petitioning for the abolition of capital punishment, initially focusing on lobbying for this kind of political reform. However, they then shift their focus to developing an institution to aid women, and thus they shift to a more institutionalized form of benevolent work. Now, I've added here on the PowerPoint the preamble to the Rosine Association's constitution, which really emphasizes respectability, religion, moral reform, um, and the intention to teach women new forms of labor, all of which were critical to the Rosine Association's work. Unlike some other organizations that existed at the time, the Rosine Association was explicitly focused on helping women who were engaged in vice and sex work. The Magdalene Society had already existed as an organization meant to aid women engaged in sex work. However, the Rosine Association was critical of the Magdalene Society because it was run by men and they argued that it often functioned more like a prison than a true asylum for women. The Rosine Association wanted to better serve the women of Philadelphia, and they believed they could help these women who were trapped in lives of vice and sin. Now, vice was not hidden in Philadelphia during this period. In fact, it was openly advertised. I have here some expert excerpts of the now infamous 1849 Guide to the Stranger, which provided a list of names and addresses of women and houses of ill fame, complete with rankings and warnings throughout the city. Um, vice and sex work were generally condemned by contemporaries, like in churches, from politicians and reformers. Um, but sources like the Guide to the Stranger helped to demonstrate the popularity of sporting mill culture, vice, um, and houses of ill fame at the time. The Rosine Association casebooks are filled with stories of women who drank liquor, visited houses of ill fame, visited theaters and bars, and engaged in sex work. However, the association considered all of these women worthy of aid 
and generally did not um, exclude them from receiving any kind of aid. Uh, now the Rosine House served as the institutional base of the organization. The house functioned as an asylum for women who upon entering were expected to modify their behavior, follow new rules and learn to perform new kinds of productive labor. The Rosine House was a domestic and confining space, although far less confining than the Magdalene Society and even less so than prisons at the time. But women were meant to stay there and be kept away from vice and dangers in the city that they had been uh, in risk of before. Well, in the house, women received training and education, and there was a huge emphasis on women learning new skills that they could use once they left the house. Women were received in the house and they were classified as inmates and they were expected to remain in the house until they were considered fit to leave. However, many women left on their own accord and the manager's reports and cases from these Rosine Association casebooks stress that a lot of women did leave early before they were considered successfully reformed or changed. Um, not all who were aided by the Rosine Association stayed in the Rosine house. And as the casebooks reveal, the stories and work of this association stretch far beyond what's actually detailed in their published narratives of their annual reports. The casebooks that I've looked at show a lot of realities of reform efforts and a lot of failures. However, um, before I get into some of these stories, I do want to stress that these casebooks need to be examined quite critically. The women writing these case files were members of the Rosine Association, and they had a stake in framing the narratives of the women they helped. Many of these stories focus on the victimization of women or the deviancy of the men and women involved in these stories. The Rosine Association and its members almost always play the roles of guides and saviors in these stories, and they really focus on the significance of reform work and their own importance. It must also be stressed that the women the Rosine Association were intending to serve and who they helped were primarily white women. These casebooks explicitly address race in several cases, and the women listed in these cases were never described with racialized terms. So we can safely assume with the language that they're using um, that they are primarily concerned with aiding white women within the city. Now, with all this in mind, these publications, um, the public publications versus these more private publications do have some noticeable differences that make these case books that weren't published quite useful. Publications that were sent out to the public like the manager's reports and things that were published in newspapers tended to focus on stirring up support for the Rosine Association and really providing quantitative evidence for why the society needed funds and support from the public. But these private case books reveal much more intimate details about the work that was happening behind the scenes. Now the first recorded case of the Rosine Association ends in tragedy. Julia McDonald was the uh, Oh, sorry. Julia McDonald was the daughter of an Irish gentleman from a good family, but she had been orphaned at a young age and never received proper moral or religious education. The Rosine Association noted that Julia had worked as an actress, lived in a house at ill fame, and struggled to work honestly throughout her life. She'd made attempts to live an honest life, but through force of circumstances, continuously struggled. She had already entered the New York Magdalene Asylum, the Philadelphia Magdalene Asylum, and eventually was committed to Moya Mensing Prison as a vagrant before eventually finding her way to the Rosine. Um, now, she was criticized for having a habit of drinking and a craving for liquor, and she ended up ultimately leaving the Rosine Association's care and alternating between bars, prison, and the Alms House before returning to the association. Um, but by the end of her case file, Julia is described as being sort of hopeless. She doesn't believe reform is possible and she ends up taking laudanum to take her own life. Now, we shouldn't assume that all of the descriptions of Julia in this case are entirely accurate, as I said. Um, however, Julia's story does provide a lot of insight into how the Rosine Association handled cases and treated women because Julia's case reveals that the Rosine Association wasn't able to fully protect and reform all of the women under their care and that they felt great sympathy for the women they were unable to save. And Julia's story doesn't even end with her own case file. Before her death, she befriended members of the Rosine Association and encouraged them to help other women she knew. In one case, while Julia was staying at the Alms House, she met a young woman and she tried to get Mira Townsend um, to help the young woman who was in need. 
Although Julia was no longer staying with the Rosine Association, she'd maintained a close enough connection to these members that she felt comfortable reaching out to ask them to help another woman. Um, and the Rosine Association immediately offered advice and eventually helped the young woman in need. And this happened in more than one case with Julia requesting aid for other women um, from the Rosine Association. Julia's own case ended in tragedy, but her connection to other women in the Rosine case books shows she was not merely a failed case noted in their society's history. Her presence was felt in other cases and her suicide was considered a significant loss to the members. Like Julia's story, the records within the Rosine case books are not simple lists of women's vice or mistakes. They read as narratives of lives filled with moments of opportunity and contingency. The story of Adelaide Maxwell demonstrates this quite clearly. Adelaide claimed in her narrative that she was the daughter of a respectable physician in South Carolina who had sent her away to boarding school at age 14. It was during this time that she was seduced by a young lieutenant who promised her marriage and took her to New York. However, this man delayed the marriage for two years and then suddenly died, leaving Adelaide alone and destitute. She attempted to learn the Milner trade, but failed and eventually ended up in assignation houses, uh, which refers to houses of ill fame or disorderly houses. Adelaide then went to Philadelphia, where she lived for three years, but according to the Rosine Association, fell into a life of degradation. Um, however, she did try to improve her life through marriage. In 1847, she married a young man and moved in with him and his sister. Unfortunately, the Rosine case file states that this man's sister discovered Adelaide's past and implies that she was forced out of the home because of this discovery. However, Adelaide discovers a pamphlet about the Rosine Association and resolves to seek out help. The Rosine Association received Adelaide and noted that she behaved perfectly for about six months before she abandons her reform efforts and returns to drinking habits. The Rosine sought Adelaide out in an attempt to bring her back and help her reform once more, uh, but Adelaide soon leaves the Rosine Association again. Now, Adelaide's story hinges on moments of decision. She was praised for wanting to reform and she was praised for seeking out the Rosine Association, but she was also criticized for her choices to leave and her choice to drink. And her story emphasizes her own personal choices and her personal failure to commit to moral reformation. The Rosine Association publicly accepted responsibility for all of the successes and failures in their work. But in these case files, we can see how much burden is put on these individual women who are expected to always make the choice to listen to the Rosine, to seek them out, and to follow all of their rules in order to become a success story in their cases. Um, but not all who came to the Rosine or who were sought out by the Rosine even wanted to change their ways. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the case of Elizabeth Schaefer, who Mira Townsend personally sought out to try to convince to seek reformation. Uh, Elizabeth Schaefer had been married to one George Schaefer, a fisherman, for about 13 years. The couple had had five children together before their marriage fell apart. Um, now, according to her case file, Elizabeth had had a sister who turned out badly. It's not fully explained, but it is implied that she led an immoral life in some way. Now, Elizabeth wanted to take her sister into their home um, and did so without getting her husband's permission. This led to an altercation with her husband, George, and ultimately the couple split up because of this fight. Um, this then led Elizabeth to, in the words of her case file, becoming what her husband had sort of accused her of becoming, of being the sort of woman her sister was. By the time she meets Mira Townsend and meets the members of the Rosine Association, um, she claims she can't remember how many times she'd been in and out of prison, but estimated she'd probably been there at least 50 times. Her case ends as a failure. The Rosine Association shows no indication that she remains in the Rosine house, that the Rosine Association even knows where she is, or that there's any chance of her being reformed. Now, in her case file, you'll note that the name of her husband is included, and the Rosine Association held men and women accountable for their actions. Um, and this shows up in other cases too. In the case of Mary Snyder, um, whose husband um, is heavily criticized in her own case, um, they talk about her life in terms of her husband's failures. So Mary Snyder's case is from 1851, and she had been married to one John Snyder, who was a carpenter. 
And John Snyder is criticized in this file for having poor management skills, for failing his business, which leads the family into falling into poverty, and then for being unfaithful, becoming diseased, for putting Mary in prison, and then the almshouse, and then eventually divorcing her. And all of these things, they say, put this stress on Mary that pushes her to drink. Now, the Rosine Association does note that Mary chooses to drink, but the majority of her case focuses on the misdeeds of her husband, John. And men are frequently the focus of the stories in the Rosine case books. The names, the occupations, and sometimes even the addresses of men are included in these stories in order to explain who influenced, helped, or hurt the women in question in these narratives. Um, there's often men who give false promises of marriage, men who lure women into vice, men who attack women, or in the case of Mary Snyder, husbands who fail women in multiple ways. Now, in public accounts, like managers' reports and public no newspaper accounts, the Rosine Association never revealed these kinds of names. But in these private accounts, we can see how they're taking seriously the individuals who are putting women in circumstances that they think uh, cause women harm. Now, the Rosine did take a public stance against the role men played in vice and crime. They believed that many women turned to sex work because they were the victims of poverty, ignorance, and neglect. And they argued that men paid an, an, played an enormous role in all of this. Um, I have here a quote from Reports and Realities from the sketchbook of a manager of the Rosine Association, which again, Mira Townsend is responsible for putting together. And this tells the story with, again, names excluded because it has a public account of how women were blamed for incidents that involved both women and men. And I think it helps to demonstrate how the Rosine Association looked at vice and crime and looked at the women they were trying to help. They didn't believe that the women they were helping were entirely guiltless. They always detailed crimes they were involved in and they always talked about immoral habits that they had in these cases. But they definitely believe that these women were victims in different circumstances, and they emphasize that in these case files. Women during this period were often victims of sexual and economic exploitation, and sex work was often a means of survival for women, and crime and vice could also be means of survival or coping for women. And the Rosine case books serve as evidence of why women were pushed into these kinds of circumstances and choices during this time period. Now, the cases I've outlined are just some of the many, many hundreds of stories in the Rosine Association case books. And many of these cases end in failure. A lot of these uh, cases go show women moving between Magdalene asylums, the Rosine house, homes that members of the Rosine Association can help them get into, almshouses, prisons, and different homes, uh, family members. Um, and we see that the Rosine Association is disappointed with the failures, but they do continuously let women come back and try again. Um, and we shouldn't be too surprised at this because as I said earlier, a lot of moral reform societies had really failed throughout the antebellum period. Moral reform and institutionalized reform during this period did not fix or eliminate crime. It didn't fix or eliminate sex work. Yet the Rosine Association's work and these casebooks documenting their work still remain significant in the historical record. Now, the Rosine Association was probably more significant in some ways to the women who were conducting reform work than some of the women who were the objects of this reform work. But these cases help us to better understand the unpublicized and intimate details of reform. And I think in light of um, Swarthmore College getting this grant from the Pew Center for a sort of renewed and new version of a Rosine Association 2.0, it's particularly important right now to look back at these case files and look back at the work of people like Mira Townsend to better understand the significance of this association and what they did. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, I'm just going to invite um, all of the speakers to, to come back on camera. Um, and uh, we have one question in the Q&A and um, it's Elizabeth Griffith asked about the role of religion in professional motherhood and women's leadership um, in reform activities. And if Elizabeth doesn't mind, after Cece answered, I'd love to roll that out to all three speakers. So thanks so much.
the role of religion was incredibly important for especially the women of Litchfield who participated in um, professional motherhood. Uh, be benevolent and charitable societies across the, the nation at the time often had a religious bent to them, whether it was you know, temperance or abstinence or you know, uh, avoiding sin and vice and all the rest. Um, and women in Litchfield had an especially uh, deep education in such, uh, such topics. Again, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, their local priest was uh, Lyman Beecher, uh, father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, Catherine Beecher. Um, and he, he was there from 1810 to 1826, during which time uh, he had quite an influence on, on those girls. He preached directly, not only to the town, but also in the school specifically um, in exchange for the education of his own daughters. Um, so these girls, you can see from their diaries and letters, had an extreme uh, reverence for um, Lyman Beecher, and they, they looked at him, especially those who uh, who were boarding from other other parts of Connecticut or New England, um, looked at him as a sort of father figure in addition to a religious figure. So um, I think that the, the religious aspect is especially clear, I think, um, in, in how those young girls developed at very formative ages to incorporate religion and religious zeal into their their personalities. Um, I, I can jump in. Um, first of all, I, I didn't manage to sort of say it, but uh, this is preliminary work on Anna Jean, sort of undertaken during the pandemic. Uh, so I wasn't able to sort of get to archival records and things the way I would like post-pandemic. But also I think she didn't do a lot of writing. There isn't a lot um, that's easily accessible to reveal her inner thoughts, but clearly religion figured prominently in her life. Um, and uh, Quaker expression is there in her opposition to football, for example. It's there in her feeling that one needed to reach out to the South to do something uh, to encourage education for the freemen. Um, but uh, actually in the Q&A, Professor Boylan asked me a question which has been very much on my mind is how aware was she of sort of the the understory or the backstory of the wealth that her family had, given the love that wealth was uh, through um, merchants, um, you know, trade and, and things like that. And that's something that one definitely has to look at. Um, I think the whole history of higher end philanthropy is undergoing a reconsideration, whether it's uh, looking at Craig Wilder's work at Harvard and thinking about how uh, the tainted history of benefaction of those institutions, or Professor um, Jones's own work uh, looking at Johns Hopkins uh, in the very recent uh, news. So I welcome that question very much. Um, I think much religion, uh, much philanthropy, even when it's given to secular causes, is driven by a deep felt religiosity. And so I think it's really hard to disentangle them, particularly in the American context. Um, in terms of the women who founded the Rosine Association, uh, there were a combination of um, religious beliefs at play. So there, there were women who were part of the, uh, who were Hicksite Quakers, and then there were women who were part of the First Unitarian Church. Uh, one thing that's interesting about the Rosine Association is unlike the Magdalene Society, which really emphasizes moral and religious teachings in their sort of reform process for the women that are brought into their asylums, the Rosine Association is actually less focused on emphasizing moral and religious teachings. It's certainly part of what they're doing and it becomes more important later. Um, but in the time period that I was talking about um, in the 18 sort of 50s for the most part, they're actually more focused on helping the women gain sort of skills related to labor than they are in terms of focusing on religious teachings and that sort of thing. It's definitely there, it's part of it. And that the underpinnings of, of course in these ideas about morality, immoral behavior, respectability and all these things, it's, it's tangled up in all of those ideas. But in terms of the reform work they're doing, I see more emphasis in the Rosine House on teaching labor skills than on this strict emphasis of reading and educating in moral, moral teachings. Great, thanks so much. Um, 
just to say, Andrea, there's a no, there's a question for you about Anna in the in the Q and A. Um, it's about Anna's awareness. Oh, and it moved up. Yes, Anna's awareness of the African American community in Philadelphia. Um, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, it's something that has not come up in the items related to her philanthropy that I've been able to see, nor do I see it necessarily in her sister's philanthropy, which seemed to be more geared towards thinking about Native American philanthropy. But again, uh, as I said, it's, this is preliminary research and I need to sort of get a better handle on what the local causes that I've looked at so far are things like winds up being Fox Chase Medical facilities or, you know, her money going back to the Philadelphia yearly meeting. Um, she just didn't write very much, but as Professor uh, Jones helped us understand in last night's keynote, um, sometimes the evidence is there, it just takes the digging. And uh, so post pandemic, I need to dig. If the person who asked the question has some leads, I'd be really interested in speaking with that person. And thank you so much for the question. Uh, great. Can I, I'm going to jump in. Um, since there are no questions in the q and I'm going to take moderator's uh, prerogative. And I have a couple questions that I'd love to know. I'm making sure there are no other q and I'm not cutting in front of anybody. Um, Carolyn, I know that, that the association members saw themselves as guides and heroes and saviors feels really uncomfortable to us now, which hints at what Andrea said about new studies, but um, what would you say is the Rosine Association's particular place in our understanding of race, class, gender, economics, looking back at the 1840s and 50s from 2021? Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think one of the things to really keep in mind, uh, as I said from the talk, is this time period of, of reform and women's reform that's happening is this emphasis on institutional reform and their emphasis on the Rosine House. And it is a little uncomfortable to read some of the case files and see the way that they are framing themselves as the women who kind of swoop in and, and kind of save these women or are the ones constantly offering help and are the only ones that can help these women. And that does feel uncomfortable. Um, but I think an important thing to think about here is how they compare with other societies at the time. Like I said, with the Magdalene Society, I think is the best comparison with the Rosine Association. And when we look at those societies next to one another, we can see how the Rosine Association was genuine in their intentions, which is a, it's a complicated kind of messy thing to look at, but they do have the intention of trying to be a better benevolent society than the Magdalene Society. They want women to be in charge of this organization. They want it to be at a group that is by women for women and that is less restrictive, that is, doesn't feel like a prison for these women, that is really going to be sort of more forgiving and helpful. Um, in these case files, we see that they forgive a lot in terms of moral transgressions. They constantly let women come back to the Rosine Association and the Rosine House. It's not as if they call them failures and then they're they're done. Um, but we also have to think about it in terms of what they were actually doing. And that's in this time period, focusing a lot on labor and about trying to help these women have jobs after they leave. And so there's a lot of domestic housework training, um, which does become something that other institutions do a little bit later, the Howard Institution, which gets founded a little bit later um, as sort of a halfway home for women who are, um, out of prison um, is a little bit comparable, but the Rosine Association is earlier and is not exclusive to uh, former prisoners. Um, and again, we do have to keep in mind that they're not helping everyone. If we're thinking about uh, race in the 19th century and during this time period, we know from other sources that there were women of color who were working in sex work and who were engaged in vice and crime in the same ways that the white women in these case files were engaged in vice and crime, but they're not showing up in these case files. Um, and in these case files, there are examples where they do talk about race and ethnicity in different ways, not often, but it does pop up. And so we can kind of see that they're either not seeking out those women 
um, or those women are not seeking them out. It's kind of unclear how exactly the women always came to the Rosine Association. I know that they hand out pamphlets in different areas around the city, um, but it is clear from the case files that they're just not really helping um, women of color in the city from, from what they've written down. And so they're very exclusively focused on white women and they're pretty much helping um, a lot of poor women, a lot of women who are Irish immigrants. It gets stressed a lot that women are from Ireland in a lot of these cases um, and a lot of women who came from good families or formerly respectable families, um, but have fallen into harsh circumstances. And so we see that kind of fallen woman trope in a lot of these narratives, that, that idea popping up again and again. Um, so I, I think we do have to look back at them and it is really complicated, that it is uncomfortable, but I think we kind of have to be a little bit okay with it being uncomfortable and complex because we can see their good intentions, but we, we know that good intentions doesn't necessarily mean that the organization um, was doing everything right by women at the time. I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much, Carolyn. It's, yeah, in the complications is the, it's interesting. There's a, there's a question in the chat from Heather. Um, it's another one for you, Carolyn. It's, why do you think the Rosine Association was more, um, quote, enlightened than other similar societies? Um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if they're more enlightened so much as I think that they, they have this idea that they really want women to be uh, in charge. And I think that their positionality makes them more enlightened, or at least more aware of women's issues at the time. The Magdalene Society really had a reputation at this point for being strict with the women who went into the Magdalene asylums. Um, and it actually pops up in a lot of the case stories that uh, women talk about how they felt that they were trapped in the Magdalene asylums and that they wanted to get out and go to the Rosine Association instead. Now that could be the Rosine members kind of skewing these narratives because they were critical of the Magdalene Society. Um, but I kind of get the impression from these readings and also reading through um, some of the writings that I've looked at of Mary Townsend's writings that the members of the, Mag uh, the Rosine Association really thought the Magdalene Society did not understand these issues because they were run by men and that there needed to be this organization of women focused on women, not focused on the worthy poor, but focused on women who really they thought needed help and who were being exploited and being the victims of terrible circumstances. And I think that's what sets them apart is that this emphasis on women helping women and not letting men be in charge of this institution because they'd already seen that as an institution and they wanted to do a better version of that. And just before I move on to the next question, um, just to point you out to what's typed in the um, in the Q and A, is that um, just about considering the Rosines um, and other women-run uh, moral phil philanthropic work, and how these groups considered the balance of blame, moral double standard, um, uh, how common. Was it that women's natural moral superiority was employed in the arguments for this kind of work? Um, can anyone talk about similar 19th and 20th century moral philanthropists um, balancing the gender specific responsibility or blame? So that will start with Carolyn, but hopefully it's gonna open up to everyone. Um, so I can say in terms of women's moral superiority being used, that's not unique to the Rosine Association or, or really this time period that goes earlier um, in, in the antebellum era with women's moral reform um, and women's benevolent work. There are lots of historians that have written about this, including my own advisor, Lori Ginsberg, who's written a great deal on this um, and many others. But that idea itself was not unique to the Rosine Association. It's an idea that gets employed by a lot of women who are involved in moral reform movements and activist movements. Um, and it, it is constantly drawn upon as this idea that women have this innate moral superiority, religious mis moral superiority in different ways. Um, that is certainly not, not unique to the Rosine Association. 
Um, so I would say that it's quite similar to a lot of organizations. Um, and in terms of gender specific blame, that's also not entirely unique to the Rosine Association either. There are other moral reform groups um, that point to men having moral failings um, as well. So these are not things that the Rosine Association invents in any ways, uh, in any kind of way, but they're just doing it in their very specific way in Philadelphia during this period. But they're drawing on um, kind of a, a legacy at that point of moral reform that had already existed in antebellum America. I'm sure others can say more. I'm going to have to, we have just a couple minutes left. So Cece and Andre, if you have anything to add, I'm so sorry to cut it short, um, but I'd love for you to add it now. Absolutely. So I think in terms of this question about um, suspect, especially the um, emphasis on women's natural moral superiority, and that's the exact sort of language and concept that women um, engaging in professional motherhood would have drawn upon um, not only their moral superiority, but the, the sort of tropes that society played towards women, whether that was uh, nurturing or, uh, you know, caring for the sick or caring for the needy, those sorts of um, things that were uh, put onto women and assumed about them um, were what they drew upon for um, motivating a lot of their work. It's um, how they they felt that it was their job to take on those benevolent and charitable roles and it's how they um, how they carried them out ultimately. That's where they they found their motivation and inspiration for for what they did was based upon largely um, what society was telling them that they were already good at. I'm fine. I, I would only add that um, while I, I have no doubt that Anna Jean's probably had a clear sense of women's um, special contributions to society, she didn't articulate them in writing the way some of her other peers did. Um, Carolyn Phelps Stokes, for example, who also was very much involved, had vast wealth and was involved in education for um, Black education and uh, Grace Dodge would be better examples of uh, very, very wealthy women who have that consciousness and, and articulate that in the process of their philanthropic gifts and activities. Um, so I just want to apologize for my very loud, wheezy old laptop and give many, many thanks to Andrea, Cece, and Carolyn. Um, this has been a fantastic panel. So thank you so much. And um, thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank you so much, everyone. Much appreciated. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much.